Hi, everybody. Welcome to our November 7th Housing Partnership meeting. Um, I see that we have one guest. Hello. Am I saying it right? Teresa Hammerly? Um, Therese. Yep, Therese. Therese Hammerly. Okay. Um, so we usually start with public comment. Are you here to, um, to let us know about something or to listen? No, to listen. I'm a, kind of a fairly new member, a new resident in Northampton. I'm a member of the local energy advocates and I am just here to listen. Great. Well, it's really super nice to have you. Everybody else here is a member of the partnership. Um, and we are expecting a guest tonight, Laura Baker from the Valley CDC. That is the Valley Community Development Corporation. So she'll be coming on in a little while. Thank you so much for being here and just listening. Not just listening, listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go to the minutes of last month. Um, would anybody like to make a motion to approve or is anybody seeing any needed corrections? I make a motion, motion to approve. Thank you, Edgardo. Second? I'll second. Let's, let's take a vote. Um, Hannah? Approve. Edgar? Yes. Gwen? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Richard? Yes. Gordon? Yes. I'm a yes. Minutes are approved from October 3rd, I think it is. Um, let's see. Okay, Ace has joined us. Um, I, I see that there's another guest here named Ed. Ed, um, you're here to listen, to, to let us know about something, or what? Okay, well, Ed will come back on, I guess, when, whenever they're ready. All right. Um, Ace, we just voted on the minutes. You weren't quite a part of that, but we have quorum anyway, so cool. Um, we're expecting Laura Baker tonight. And before that, we have, um, I'm naturally missing my agenda. We have, um, sorry, I'm super disorganized. I think it's the discussion on the housing partnership charter. Yes. And Richard, before you start that, let me just make two announcements. One is that Jen Derringer resigned from this committee uh, for personal reasons. So she will no longer be here. So we have a couple openings. And secondly, Bev Bates sends her regrets. She had to put her dog down this morning and she felt she couldn't wrap her mind around being here tonight. So totally understand that. Okay, so Richard, it's, it's, uh, the discussion is punted to you. Okay, I, I will give it a try. So the reason that I raise this, uh, you know, co has come up several times is that Originally, when the housing partnership was formed, I'll have to think, but it's probably close to 30 years ago, uh, that it was viewed as a very significant and comprehensive way to coordinate housing, affordable housing policy, and understand the impacts of it in all the departments. And it was recognized that. It just is not a little niche that happens in, you know, our little corner of uh, the housing partnership world. Obviously, zoning is something where we know it's intimately connected, but there are other areas, you know, where it happens. How the the building department, and the fire department interfaces with the 
uh, existing landlords uh, affects affordability. There are decisions about parking or, you know, all sorts of things, transit or, um, and so our original enabling ordinance basically required as a matter of Northampton's ordinance that anything that affected affordable housing came to us for our comments. And it wasn't that we were had a role where we could yay or nay, but the, the point was to sort of try and integrate and um, make people aware and also reflect our sort of educational role that um, not only did we need to outreach to the whole community, but sometimes we need to outreach, you know, to our uh, elected leaders and department heads and stuff like that. And um, that role actually got cut out from us without our consent, knowledge, or whatever, uh, when the city ordinances were recodified. And I, I raised at the time, I'm not particularly happy about both the outcome and the process. And, uh, you know, as I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to stay on this board forever, uh, even though it sometimes seems like it. Um, and I wanted this historical awareness to be there for everyone on the partnership. And also, uh, there are moments in time when I think it's useful to, you know, be aware of it ourselves and perhaps let the mayor or the planning department know. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure where to go with it. I'm not necessarily suggesting that we ask for a charter review, but I, I, I thought it was important for everybody on the partnership to know. I'd happy to take questions. And so what you got sent as an attachment was, I believe the original ordinance and two um, potential um, um, revisions along the way and uh, that does not include our current ordinance. And also it was a little unsettling that I was the repository of this information that the city clerk couldn't readily get to it uh, and that there doesn't seem to be much historical uh, recollection of it. Does anybody have a question or comment for Richard? So I do have one and that is Gwen has a hand up. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I just realized too that you usually say raise your real hand and I didn't do that. So Yeah. And the um, and the thing is that you're at the very top of my screen. I can only see the bottom of you. Gwen, go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, okay. So I have a question just for clarity's sake. Um are you referring so I I have read the 1995 one pretty like I think I made it through the first half of it um I was taking notes and reflecting on it um so it is different than the 1991 one is that right I believe so it's been quite a while since I you know it's been several months since I reviewed it okay um and so my question would be um what specifically changed? Um, I mean, I think you said it, that there was kind of a chain of command that people mm -hmm. would, okay, so that chain of command isn't there. Um, uh, so that's really important to have that um, so that people know what to do and what to expect. Um, and then um, another thing that I'm thinking about in terms of any kind of amending or anything like that is that we most certainly should update it for you know what's going on in the city in terms of environment um climate you know clean energy um that's certainly i'm thinking <laughs> why our visitor could talk maybe to some of that um at some point um you know just um you know because how could we not talk about that if the goal is preservation and and all of that. So those are just some of my thoughts on that. 
Richard, I had one question and that is sort of like following up on Gwen's and that is, what do you think um, the major things are that might have been lost in the revisions of the charter? I think the fundamental thing that I feel is missing is the requirement that every buddy in the city whose decisions might affect affordable housing should not make those decisions in a vacuum without going to the board that is thinking about that from our perspective. And it may be that some things are impractical, or we may decide that, for example, some affordable, some uh, environmental standards are more important to achieve than the cost on the housing, even if it affects people at the lower end. But those are decisions that ought to be talked about and talked about with us. So the fact that that protocol of refer stuff to the housing partnership, and it shouldn't be a burden to plan that much in advance. Most of the stuff that happens in the city goes through multiple readings and committee processes and all that. It's not a hardship to refer stuff to us and ask for insight, input, or thoughts, or make us aware. So it's a two-way street, and you know we know housing is central to uh, so much of what affects the citizens in our community, and so that's why it's important that we think um, broadly. So I want to ask the question, do we want to um, uh, take any steps from here? But I'm also aware that Laura Baker's here. I wonder if we can hold this discussion here, go to Laura Baker, and then come back to it during our discussion period. I'm patient. Feel free to keep talking because it'll okay, help me learn what you're interested yeah. in. Well, All right, I, great. I would make a minimum recommendation. Um, and partly it's to go on record, which is to essentially write a letter to the planning department and the mayor and say, you know, we've been doing some historical research. We see that our role, while we never viewed our role differently, we see that officially our role has changed. And we think that there was importance to that uh, process. And we wanted to make you aware that it's changed and we're thinking about and welcome your input on whether or not there should be steps taken to address it. Just to put a marker out there so that this issue doesn't get lost completely. Uh, and, and also because I think we've made the decision before that it's always better to, especially when we're going to the mayor or the planning department to say this is our concern what do you think as opposed to going to them and saying we want to do x y and z it's more politic and it's the same process that we're asking them to do in reverse we're saying here's a concern it may affect you we want your take on it so that would be my recommendation and uh, i could move that a letter get drafted uh to that effect, if that would be helpful. Gwen? Um, and it kind of goes along with um, what Richard was just talking about. So hold on one second. Um, so there were, in looking at the 95 one, um, it wasn't clear to me um except to say that 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 we're here to educate about housing needs in the regional area and so would this include um educating residents or tenants also educating landlords um it doesn't specify and then um it would seem to me that in some of the wording um you know i guess we're going to i'll talk about it i'll talk about it so it seems it seems to support 
ha having um, a connection between government organizations or government agencies and and landlords. I mean, that would be the support of that. That would be what this is. So I just wrote, should it be that um, housing authorities, landlords or developers are interacting with and being a part of the housing solutions that we're talking about? And if so, what does that mean? So what about safety issues or envir environmental issues that are persistent? Um, should this be part of the mission to include new updated terms such as quarterly meetings with the Board of Health, um, quarterly meetings with the Human Rights Commission? Um, and um, like you mentioned, you know, to meet with the mayor, um, to maybe talk about like bylaws or home rule petitions that exist that have been updated since 1995. Um, and then, um, so then um, should we include or even link with, I, I mentioned that. Okay, and then for any, for like, for example, um, we have a member of the, of the partnership here who serves on both. So what, what does that role look like? What are the roles and responsibilities in that role um, in terms of bringing it to the partnership? Um, does that mean there would be an expectation um, on reporting back up about the findings? And then should there be a schedule for that as a regular part of the meetings, for example, quarterly? And then should all government agencies, including agencies that are funded and are overseen by DHCD and HUD, um, and maybe Hab Habitat for Humanity as well, um, be alerted to local home rules, new petitions for the purpose of consistency in the city, um, for our low income residents and then also um, like any sort of um, goals that are being worked at within the city with low income housing around um, climate stuff, our goals. So Gwen, you brought up a lot of really good points that, that might be in the near future, but I wanna go back Richard to you and your proposal that the letter be drafted hopefully with your input to um, the mayor um, stating what you had what you had said before I'll let you say it again and let's vote on that because I think that that is the first step towards alerting and taking then the next steps after that and seeing what the response is do you want to make a motion sure I'll do that and I would note I just was looking back there is a very specific piece in the 1991 enabling ordinance that said city council shall refer all proposed legislation that deals with affordable housing to the housing partnership right. for recommendation. So at any rate, um, perhaps uh, Keith can also um, add anything that I might miss on this retelling going back to what I spoke to previously, but the general thrust would be, you know, the housing partnership has been um, evaluating our role and how we can best achieve the affordable housing goals for the city. And we have noted that our previous enabling ordinance had a more comprehensive protocol in the city for other boards, agencies, and actors to communicate on issues that might affect affordable housing to us for our input. And we think that there is merit in that prior approach, which no longer is in our enabling ordinance and we are pondering what to do about it and seek your thoughts and input. Does anybody second that? I'll, I'll second, second that. it. Oh. Okay, Hannah, thank you. All right, let's take a vote. Gordon. Gwen. Yes. Edgar. C. <laughs> Hannah. Yep. Sarah. Okay. Uh, Ace. 
Yes. Um, and I will say yes. Uh, so, I get to vote too. Oh, yeah. you, Richard. Okay. I, I forgot all about you, but go ahead. Jeez, how could you do that? <laughs> all right. So, um, would you be willing to at least draft a first draft of this letter and then we'll work on it together? I think it might be more productive if I do it in conjunction with Keith, since it's already sort of recorded. Um, yeah. And I would be happy to do that. If that's, that's even okay. better. Keith. Keith, yes. Thank you very much. All right. So, Laura Baker from Valley CDC, I want to welcome you. Thank you very much. It's good I to be back. I think the most recent time we had you here was, I think, in April when you were presenting about the um, Northampton Nursing Home yeah. renovation and yeah. rejuvenation, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, thanks so much for making the time to be here. <clears throat> I'm just going to do a broad brush stroke here, and then I'm going to ask other members of the housing partnership to ask more specific questions. And when you ask the question, please just introduce yourself for, for a moment rather than going around to everybody right now. Um, we've been, for the last few months, we've been asking ourselves and we, we met with Carolyn Mish and Mayor Shara last month. Um, is, could we, could we do more affordable housing? Uh -huh. And if we, have a barrier somewhere, is it money or is it capacity? Um, obviously you're from a nonprofit agency that's different from a private developer, but we wondered what you thought about uh, barriers, money versus capacity. That's painted with a very broad brush stroke in like a kind of a okra tone. Um, do you want to say a few words about that? And then we can go to um, specific questions from other housing partnership people or from either of our two guests tonight from the public. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm sorry, I haven't been here more often and I'm happy to try to do that. Um, I think it, it helps ground the work to have someone who's kind of in the field also as a participant. And so yeah. I, if you want me to, I can be happy to, book you in my calendar and, and try to be more present um, with the Northampton Housing Partnership. Richard knows, other people may not know, I served on the Housing Partnership for about five years, decades ago. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. And it's a group that I care about a lot. Northampton is my hometown and of course where I'm working um, now. Um, I, I'll make an overall observation that I think we are coming into a period of, of accelerated affordable housing production, which is super exciting. Um, it is offset by the fact that the needs are growing faster than our ability to house people. So even though we are scrambling like little hamsters on a wheel trying to produce housing, the needs are also, as I'm sure you're aware, um, really ramping up at the same time. Um, so I made a, a series of notes that I'm happy to share with the group. Um, really my observations on what it's like being an affordable housing developer in the city of Northampton, um, areas where I think the city is really excellent and strong, areas where maybe more work could be done, um, but I'm just trying to suss out where you're at. So happy to also just lay back and let you ask me some questions. I think it would be really helpful if you could share your notes with us. I like how you've divided that into excellent and strong and needs more work. I think we could, as this committee, could use more grounding, like you just you just said that word. And I think I think I I'd like to start with your sharing those notes with us. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel out of touch. Um, I, I just would comment when I was on the housing partnership, I, I believe we had a subcommittee that did um, evaluated project proposals. So anything that went in for CDBG money uh, went through a subcommittee and we were kind of the experts, the volunteer experts, and then we would make a recommendation to the mayor's office. And 
I don't know if that's still happening, but it allowed um, the housing partnership to be pretty knowledgeable and engaged with, you know, really knowing the details of the affordable housing development work that was happening in the city. So um, just, just one comment. Yeah, we were just talking about um, the fact that um, the, the CDBG affordable housing um, applications no longer come through us and that leaves us out of the loop. Yep. Um, and that's something that we want to change. Yeah, no, I was I was kind of picking up on that. And yeah. it did used to be pretty standard procedure that this was the body. I, I can speculate about why that has changed. Um, and it's part of, I think, what, what is going on with the strengths um, having to do with doing this work in, in Northampton. Um, well, first of all, you, you were talking about kind of why isn't there more affordable housing? What could happen to create more affordable housing? Because I think it's obvious to me, it's obvious to us that there is a need. Um, I have for years have thought that the biggest obstacle to affordable housing development is finding appropriate, available and affordable sites. And then the kind of subset to that is overcoming zoning barriers and neighborhood opposition. So to me, the siting of affordable housing has always been super challenging. And if we could kind of get that, we could put all the rest together. If we couldn't get that, nothing went forward. You can't you know, put a project together without a, a viable site. And Northampton being kind of a, a high housing, you know, a desirable housing marketplace is one of the challenges um, with finding those good sites in Northampton that are kind of transit friendly. Uh, I would say my perception has changed a little bit in the last year. Um, coming up fast and hard on the heels of that is the cost of construction. Um, it's become uh, almost unmanageable. And so, we're looking at costs of you know, 350 to $400 a square foot um, for building, sometimes higher. Uh, we're looking at a total development cost per unit of over $500,000. And in uh, I know in DHCD in, this, in the state, they've seen over a million dollars per unit development cost for affordable housing. And they are freaking out because they can't, it's not politically viable to finance projects at that price tag. And yet it is in fact what things are costing these days. So it's a big problem. We're all, I think, aware of supply chain issues and, and shortages. So cost of construction and cost of related, you know, survey work, attorneys, architects, engineers, everything has kind of ballooned. Um, and I'm hoping it'll level out, but we haven't really seen it yet. And so our ability even with having a good site and a supportive city like Northampton is and a supportive state like Massachusetts is, we are really hitting our heads against the ceiling um, of, of cost. Uh, Northampton is my very, very favorite place to work on affordable housing. It's the best. Um, and I've probably worked in maybe half a dozen communities, so it's not a huge sampling, <laughs> but... Um, it is a really supportive uh, place to work. Uh, the things that I've seen the city do that have helped promote the work that Valley does um, include identifying city-owned parcels. So particularly when Wayne was around, he was hot on the trail of turning over city resources that the city controlled for the purpose of, of creating affordable housing. Um, Carolyn and others in the office have been pretty remarkable at um, kind of putting zoning overlays on particular parcels, in particular 40, 40R, which then allows uh, a developer like Valley to come in and build by right housing, multifamily housing at density. So uh, just as an example, the nursing home property, we could do that type of um, housing under URB, but we'd have to go through a special permit process. The city overlaid a 40R district on it, and it went through by right, and it's a much simpler, cleaner, faster zoning process, which is huge. Sometimes our projects can get stuck in permitting and appeals for extended periods of time. Um, the city is strong in contributing local resources, whether it's land, CPA money, or CDPG money. 
Um, and I would just caveat that with, with saying that the, the local contributions that for years we've been seeking and happily receiving of, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars per project are out of date now. So we asked for, and I'm happy to report received a million dollars for the nursing home project, but that is more the kind of price tag of the future um, because of the cost issues that I mentioned earlier. So the kind of expectation of like, what does it take from a city to get the development of affordable housing? It might still be the same small percentage of the total, but that number, that dollar value number has to increase or we're not gonna be able to do this work. Um, the city is very good, uh, masterful at raising other grant funds in support of affordable housing. Nobody cranks out grants like Northampton. So whether it's MassWorks, which wins a lumberyard property, Housing Choice Grant, which is going into our Laurel Street project. I mean, they go out, they got just got another housing choice grant to extend sidewalks um, near the nursing home property. So all these kind of tangential tag on sources of money that only municipalities can get, Northampton goes out and grabs those and kind of makes them, makes the project stronger um, through raising those resources. Um, the staff in uh, Keith's office is wonderfully helpful uh, when we need technical assistance. Uh, if we need to consult around zoning, they always make time for us. And if we need environmental review work done, they get it done. And that's big in our in our world. Um, the staff, the mayor, city councilors are all very supportive, as is the housing partnership. They will um, provide letters. They will put calls into DHCD. Um, we've had really good success recently working with the ward councilors. Um, and the councilors have been our, our neighborhood champions almost. They have they have coordinated neighborhood meetings. They've used their listservs to disseminate information and having them be the kind of honest broker for the information has, it's it's been a really helpful thing rather than just us and the neighbors kind of like, <laughs> you know, having the word counselor in the middle, kind of just trying to really make sure everybody's questions are answered, everybody gets information. It's really kind of neutralized some of the emotions that can go along with the process. So it's been very, very successful. Uh, the fact that Northampton is the only community we work in that doesn't require local preference. So when we do certain types of zonings, uh, municipalities can request local preference from the state, which at this point in time, we've come to see as a way of perpetuating segregation. So if only the people who already li live in your predominantly white community, if those people have preference for your affordable housing, guess what happens? You start to perpetuate those patterns. So we are having that discussion at other cities and towns who will not yield on the issue of local preference. And Northampton has never once requested it um, for one of our projects because I think rightfully they have characterized affordable housing as a regional, housing in general, as a regional issue, regional resource, regional need. Um, things that I think could be done to strengthen the work that we do. I know that there was a YIMBY group. I believe there was a YIMBY group in Northampton. But a I what don't, group? YIMBY. A what? Yes, yes in my backyard. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know about that, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, that is um, news to me, I must say. So the profile of that group is pretty modest. Now, to be fair, we haven't like leaned on them. We haven't had any really contentious neighborhood situations lately, but the time will come when we do. And so they have a group in Amherst, they have the trust, which is kind of like the housing partnership. It's more of a government, you know, it's a it's a committee of government. And then they have the Affordable Housing Coalition, which is volunteers, it's not government. And it allows that group to be outspoken advocates in ways that sometimes you can't when you're within the municipal structure. Um, so that group was instrumental. I think we wouldn't have gotten through, we were doing a kind of a small studio apartment building in Amherst now called East Gables on Northampton Road. It was very controversial. Mm. Uh, a lot of pushback from neighbors. And I don't think we would have, I don't think we'd be building it now were it not for that um, group. So they um, 
basically had done the setting of the table and the, and the and the homework so that when we came along with the project, they had a network available of people who could show up at public meetings, who were writing letters to the city town council, writing letters to the newspaper, just kind of vocalizing. Um, what happens a lot of times at um, hearings is that neighbors will come because they're very invested. And the low-income tenants who we will house eventually often have no voice um, at those kinds of meetings. So it's it's finding, um, you know, it's organizing, basically. It's organizing a group that's going to be there at a moment's notice when you need them to say positive things about the need for affordable housing. Um, I think that the housing partnership has an important role to play in advocating for use of city resources. And I think particularly of CPA money where we're going in or affordable housing developers are going in and we're in competition with other absolutely worthy projects. Um, and some of those projects have a wide group of spokespeople. You know, you're doing a playground at an elementary school. You have all the parents, you have this big groundswell. So um, having the partnership and maybe a, a, another ancillary group Again, advocating, and I know that you've done some of this with the CPA, but advocating for the importance, the relative importance of affordable housing um, in the city. Uh, I know I've heard the partnership talk before about kind of a coordinated education effort taking the form of op-eds or letters to the editor. I think that's hugely valuable to keep up that work. I know there's someone on the partnership who <laughs> was always the designated writer. Maybe that person's not around anymore. Um, but it's keeping it in the public eye that this is still a concern, it's still a problem, it's it, it's something that we all need to be thinking about. Um, I think community education is, is critically important. Um, I think part of the reason people don't want affordable housing in their neighborhoods is a lack of education about what it, what it is. Um, so education around the causes of homelessness, the best practices and solutions to homelessness, the severity of the housing shortage that we're facing, the actual cost of housing. A lot of people don't understand how much rents are in Northampton. Like they literally have, they're a homeowner, they have no idea. Uh, and the issue of racial income and wealth gaps and how profound those are, I feel like is, again, it's something that needs ongoing education. Um, I would love to see the housing partnership. I, I would love for Valley to have um, a more direct line of communication with our constituents who are low-income tenants. I feel it's a weakness of our organization and it's something we're interested in getting better at. And I think the housing partnership also could play a role in in the general idea of bringing the voices of people who are even living in low-income housing or going to live in low-income housing, bringing those voices to the table, um, especially as we as developers design things where people will live without ever talking to them. You know, I mean, that's not the position that we want to be in. So, and yet we don't know who's going to live in the, in the housing. We have no audience to talk with. Um, and so just a general general thought on that. Um, I'm going to mention one thing that was, I just think it was a loss um, to the city, which is uh, for about 30 years, Northampton funded uh, an SRO outreach worker. Valley owns a number of what are SRO buildings, single room occupancy buildings um, that house high need tenants, often tenants coming out of homelessness. Um, and we really relied upon that position for decades. And it, during the pandemic, it went away, it's gone. <laughs> and we really miss it. And we've applied for some CPA money to try to recreate um, that position in our properties. Um, but when things like that are happening, I think I kind of hear you talking about this already is what's, what's the, how can the housing partnership have a voice at the table when these kinds of decisions are being made that directly affect housing? So this was an outreach worker case manager position who helped people um, get into housing, but also preserve their housing. So those who are at risk of eviction, 
we're trying desperately to keep people housed because we're kind of the bottom rung of the ladder. If they get evicted, they may not survive. They, that's the reality of it. So that's a really critical role. Um, I have a few mixed on the mixed, you know, side of the scale. Um, Northampton is pushing hard on energy efficiency and uh, having fossil fuel free properties. That's an expectation that we're being asked to meet. We are happy. We agree with the values that are being espoused by the city. And we are afraid for our lives in terms of the cost. And so, you know, as the city rolls out these very aggressive um, energy standards um, and, you know, getting off of fossil fuel, just having a way to buffer the cost of that, not only at the front end, but the ongoing cost. We basically are being asked to create all electric buildings at a time when electricity is going to go through the roof. And we pay the we pay the electricity costs for our tenants. So we are we are creating a situation where the housing will be at risk. Um, it, it, it won't cash flow. Um, so coming years, um, I did a little jotting down of what I think is coming. Uh, what we're seeing is that ARPA is gonna dominate our world for the next, probably from 23 to 26. It's and can you tell us, for those who don't know what ARPA is, it's the uh, American Recovery and Protection Act. I don't know. <laughs> okay. it's, it's COVID relief money um, that came primarily from the federal government. Um, huge amounts um, came with to the state, some came to the city. Um, and I'm hoping that this partnership has been advocating with the city to use some of their ARPA money for housing, because I think that's an important thing to do. Um, there's a lot of it at the state level and there's so much they're going to have trouble getting out the door in time it's got very specific deadlines you have to commit these funds by the end of 2024 you have to expend them by the end of 2026 and in the affordable housing world that's that's lightning speed so valley and others are we're scrambling we're we're lining up projects as quickly as possible we're going to see this mushroom of activity um I think followed by a contraction of resources is my guess. So all this money gets dumped into the system, construction costs stay sky high, everything costs a lot, things are getting done, and then the money ends. Things kind of tank. And I would just say, if I were on the housing partnership and, and working at Valley, I'm kind of thinking about 2027. Like, what's our plan? How how are we planning? How are we saving for the end of that big wave of resources? Um, and and are there ways we can use those resources to buffer that that downtrend? And it, it's a trickier question, but just throw it out there. Um, I think those were my talking points. So I'll stop and let people ask questions or make comments. Thank you very much sure. for rounding sure. us. Richard. Uh, yeah, that was an extremely helpful overview and, and thank yeah. you. And um, we welcome that insight and communication. I, I want to be a little bit more direct with um, one question that was sort of on our minds when we have been having a discussion with the city about our affordable housing trust fund, which is a separate um, structure. Yeah. And in theory, there are potential sources of revenue that might flow directly into uh, that trust fund. And um, just to do full disclosure, this I think the general sense we get from the city is they don't want another administrative structure to have to deal with, even though that's already on the books, and B, the position of the city, as if I understand correctly, is money is not a problem for um, affordable housing creation. There is enough funds that get generated by the CPC, and so there's no intrinsic benefit to having another source that's solely dedicated. And I thought I heard you say finding sites that are affordable and, you know, construction costs and all those things 
have a monetary um, uh, challenge to them. And so uh, I invite you without necessarily jeopardizing any uh, relationship with the city to think about, to talk to us about whether money that was not competing with playgrounds and other things like that. Um, you know, we do recognize money is fungible and if, if we've got money, then maybe the uh, CPC is gonna cut back, but I don't know. We welcome your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, I've had these conversations before with staff in the planning office about, you know, the the cost of affordable housing is such that it's never going to be totally or even primarily financed with local money, is my guess. And so where's your biggest point of leverage? I think it's with sites and with zoning. I think you have more power with sites and with zoning. But I also think that the days when the city could put in a little bit and the state could make up the rest, those days are ending. The state doesn't have enough money either. And so they're looking back at cities and towns saying, you want this housing? You got to put in more. <laughs> so it is a changing game. I think you the more dedicated resources you have, the better. Um, I think, you know, I've worked a fair amount with the trust structure in Amherst. Um, and that would be, I'm sure you've talked with John Horton before and others at the trust to, to see how they do it there. Um, I, I think you have to have someone who's willing to chair your trust, who's going to put in a lot of time and energy to make it a productive group. So in Northampton, you have phenomenally capable, dedicated staff. It's a strength, but it may also let volunteers kind of sit back on their heels a bit because the staff's going to take care of it. And then the staff's like, well, we'll just take care of it. And you set up a dynamic where it's a staff led endeavor. Um, and so if that's the staff experience, then yeah, why would they want another volunteer board <laughs> to babysit? You know, I mean, unless there's going to be real. Um, volunteer person power. Um, you know, you need you need if you're having trouble getting members on the partnership, if you're having trouble getting quorums, I mean, I, I don't know what's I don't know what the status of things, but you do need a critical mass of volunteer energy um, to sustain organizations. And so if you're finding that you have that in spades in the housing partnership and there's extra, there's surplus that could go over and really, you know, someone can really put their teeth into a housing trust. Um, that's awesome. I mean, I, I think it's a very valuable tool if people have the time and energy to, to put into it. Um, it can okay. hold money and raise money in ways that maybe are, are not happening now in the city. Um, but your city staff is, they're doing a lot. I, I almost wonder, if there's if it's being clearly communicated to the partnership how much your city staff are doing to promote affordable housing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Who else has a question? Sarah. Um, well, this is just sort of a follow up with that with that, but I guess my understanding with the housing trust fund in Amherst. Or one of the benefits is that it's more of an ongoingly available pot of money. Like it's that you don't have to come and make the requests at a certain time of the year, and um, that that make it's that flexibility is makes it more um, helpful yeah. in, in development. Is that the key? Yeah, is, that is that, that is that was part of the intention of it. And in fact, Valley used uh, the trust money that way. Uh, we had a gap um, because of construction costs at our project under construction in Amherst. We went to the trust, asked for $100,000. They were able to turn that around you know, in a few weeks as opposed to waiting. They have an annual cycle for CPA. So it would have been mm -hmm. a long wait for that. The other thing I've seen them do is that their trust will ask for money from the CPA every year. 
Um, they usually don't get all that they ask for. They usually ask for like half a million dollars, <laughs> but it's it, and they, they stockpile it. Um, and so, you know, I know from being before the CPA, some years there's lots of housing projects. The next year there's no housing projects. It's uneven because of the nature of development cycles. So the other thing the trust can do is kind of even that out a bit. So if you're getting um, allocations of CPA money every year that are going into a trust, then when a big ass comes in, you you save the money for it. Um, so that kind of answers, in a way, the issue of, you know, is enough of the CPA, or will they reduce the percentage of CPA that's getting allocated for affordable housing? Because the trust can just ask if I mean, not that they'll necessarily get it, but it, it's not. That's a way to to keep the percentage up, right? If it's allocated from CPA. Yeah, I mean, we've done both in Amherst. We usually go to the CPA first mm -hmm. um, and then head over to the trust for the rest of the money that we might need. Um, is the so trust with, um, sorry, I have so many questions. But, <laughs> um, well, when you were, you were talking about the concern with the, the all electric, you know, producing um, housing, and the co cost burden, yep. the potential cost burden. Yep. Is that, and I, sorry if this is a dumb question, but is the that sort of cost something that you can um, mitigate with funds from the trust fund? I mean, is that something that potentially Northampton could, because we're also talking about, you know, having a real estate transfer fee and like if we could use that funding, could that help to solve that, that looming fear for you <laughs> like would that sort of um create i mean can it be used to for that yes. sort of cost or is it just for um so <laughs> it, it, for us ultimately because we tend to create almost always 100 percent affordable housing pretty much everything we do is eligible for the various pots of money that the city has and it's really just getting up to that big number so if you use it for some solar panels, you don't have it for something else. And so it's not just replace it. We can't just replace, we need more. <laughs> um, and especially as we get into the operating phase, um, we're gonna need to, we're gonna need to do things differently. So for example, sorry, Gwen, I'm, do you wanna go <laughs> at the nursing home? It's a it's a 60 unit all electric building, old building. You know, we can't make it super, super tight on the envelope. You know, all electric, AC, heat, hot water production, everything. Um, we're trying to, we're looking at geothermal actually for that building because we are so concerned about not being able to pay the bills going forward. And to add geothermal to that building will be about 1.2 to $1.5 million on top of all the regular construction costs. So it becomes a big challenge. So let me th thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, who else has their hands up? I wanna wrap this up in the next five or 10 minutes. I know Gwen, you had your hand up and who else has a question at this point? Nobody, I'm taking it. Okay, Gwen, go ahead. Okay, so um, this is this is great. Um, so uh, when I came to see, I, I came when you guys were presenting and there was a neighborhood meeting um, and we walked around Remember? and then, yep. And then I attended a meeting recently where I think I viewed it afterwards. Um, Somehow I missed that one, but um, it was a moment for the neighbors to speak out um, and give their feedback about how they thought, you know, what they thought about the project and whatnot. Yeah. And um, so that was interesting, you know. Um, you know the 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 feedback was a little interesting, but um, in terms of a trust fund, I am curious to know: is it that the trust fund can collect? Um, interest if it's while it's sitting and then also will the state match what 
if we are making that effort to have that trust fund, um, you know, is the state making, observing that and saying, okay, well, we'll match you. And then um, what happens is, I think I did understand it correctly, as you said, the, the CPC would just simply give a certain amount each year to that fund. And would it be collecting interest? Well, not necessarily. I mean, you'd have to request it and convince them to give it to you. Okay. They wouldn't just automatically give it to you. Okay. They might say, no, we want to make okay. our own decisions about which affordable housing projects to, to fund. I see. Um, okay. I don't know of any state matching money. I think there are some grants available more in the technical assistance side of things for communities that have an affordable housing trust. Like you can get lots of training. Um, other sources of money that I've seen go into trusts. Um, you know, sometimes money comes into a community that doesn't really have another natural home. Like a developer pays some fee for, for getting some different kind of density in their housing. And it's this, you know, what do you do with it? It can go into a trust. Um, I know in Northampton, you're collecting fees, the short-term rental fees, for example, from like Airbnb kinds of places. like. There's money floating right. around that doesn't really necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. I would I would be thinking about, is there enough money that's gonna come into this trust to justify the management costs? Right. You know, the, the human capital costs of maintaining it. Right, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you very much, um, Therese. Therese is a member of the public. She's not a member of the partnership. She's here to listen Therese. and do what she would like to add a comment or question. A question. You know, when I think about money floating around, I wonder sometimes, um, and I'm from the, just to be clear, from the local energy advocates and, you know, clearly want to advocate for energy efficient buildings and all electric buildings as the way we have to go forward. Um, but, you know, I think about, all of the benefits that an individual homeowner can receive to, you know, finance for zero interest, uh, uh, air source heat pump, or, you know, maybe even a ground source heat pump, um, and other things like the, um, you know, the, the hot water heaters, is none of that available to you? Um, some of it is available. Uh, it's quirky. It changes pretty much every year. But yes, we typically will uh, be able to hit somebody's criteria to receive some incentive funds. It doesn't offset the cost of the original construction. Um, and it doesn't necessarily offset the cost of operations. It, it sweetens it a little bit. We do, we do apply for all of those programs that are out there that are applicable to us. Um, well, you know, you probably know some of the folks from the local energy advocates. I mean, I would, I would just think it might be really um, productive to put our heads together, you know, keep thinking. Thank you, Therese. Thanks. Any other questions before we wrap up? Sarah? Oh, I just want to, um, ask Therese at the end if you can tell me more about the local energy advocates because I'd like to get involved. <laughs> oh, I, I would. Um, but, but maybe we can do that at the end. So it's, if the chat is accessible to me, which I think it is, I would put my email in there if that's kosher. Sure. Okay, I will do that. Absolutely. Instead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're from you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, Thank you so much for coming to meet with us, Laura. Um, this has been super helpful. Like you said at the very beginning, I think it's it's for, cer certainly for me and I think for other people it's helped ground us. Um, we'd like to have you back more regularly. So we will definitely stay in touch. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I, would, I would be happy to be a more regular participant. Great, and this will inform the rest of our discussion tonight. So thank you very much. And you're obviously welcome I'm to stay. stay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Much appreciated, Laura. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Edgar. So um, on the agenda now is next steps for the Affordable Housing Trust. 
I meant to, to uh, mention this to Laura and I'll say it right now because I know she's listening. We've had pushback from the city on why would we need such a thing? And I think a lot of that has to do with the management of it and the kind of the, you know, the person power that would be involved in that. We're a couple people down on the housing partnership. So it's not exactly like we're brimming over with members here. Anyway, discussion on next steps for affordable housing trust fund. Does anybody have anything to say about that? Richard? I want to postulate that in my experience with the housing partnership, when we were doing work that really felt like we had this dynamic role of assessing uh, projects and hearing about them and whatever, that that may have been more engaging for some kind of people and brought an energy that is different than the challenges we're facing now. So I, I, I can't say conclusively, uh, but it's sort of like, yeah, if you build it, they will come. If we had a, if we had a role, uh, then maybe the affordable housing trust fund uh, would be more analogous to what the kinds of things that we were doing early on in the partnership. Thanks, Richard. Other comments? Ace? Uh, to, to clarify, this is about the um, affordable housing trust fund, yeah? Yeah. So um, the, the, the thing that I'm working on uh, for the tax on um, real estate sales, it, assuming that it goes through such that municipalities can do it. It specifically says in there that that money has to go to an affordable housing trust fund if one exists. And given the amount of time and effort it's taken for a home rule petition, uh, I, I think if we want that bill to happen, we really do need to reactivate the, the, the housing trust uh, because otherwise it will be two years before we can collect that money. Uh, so in in terms of incentivizing it to be reactivated, that's on the table. Thank you. But I think it technically exists and they have to comply with that. Is that correct? Well, right now there is not a state law that lets us have this fee. There are some that are in process to get passed. If any of those do pass, all of them do specify that the money has to go to a housing trust fund. So right now it's a maybe. Right now we have to do a home rule petition regardless. But if that gets passed before we start the home rule petition process, then it, it would go much faster if we could just pass the bill. I think it kind of, they go hand in hand you're saying, and I mean, Laura was saying, um, you know, it would make sense to activate the housing trust fund if there was going to be enough money to cover the administrative costs. And if we do actually pass and get the, um, the real estate transfer fee through, then that would um, ostensibly provide that funding plus, you know, plus extra for affordable housing. That's the whole point. So it seems kind of like a beautiful thing if, if they would both happen, <laughs> at least from my, that's how I'm looking at it. And it sounds like there's no end to the need for housing funding sources. Right, so I'd like to make a comment here and that is that um, we heard from, Mayor Shara and Carolyn Mish last month, who essentially said, well, money isn't the obstacle and they wanted us to 
um, focus on advocacy. We're hearing from Laura Baker that, and as sort of we know from looking at the last few years that construction costs are skyrocketing. I'm not sure why, I think we're all puzzled by why we've met this resistance from the city around activating the housing trust fund. But this is dovetailing, Richard, with your bringing up these two ordinance or these two um, charters, right, for the housing partnership. It used to be that, and written into the housing partnership charter is subcommittees will form to do some of this more specific work. And we haven't been doing that. And I'm, I'm wondering if we need to have a subcommittee to really pursue uh, the reactivation of the housing partnership. I think we all agree that's a good idea. I think Laura Baker sort of summarized some of the reasons that we knew from our research why it would be a good idea. And I don't think we can accomplish everything by talking in a 10 person group once a month like this. I'm wondering what other people think. I wonder if some of the resistance from the mayor's office is like, you know, the, the concern about having the funding. So if it was presented as, you know, if we get the home rule uh, petition approved, then we would like to activate, activate the housing trust fund. Because that way it would be like, here's the, the funding source. It's the real estate transfer fee. Mm -hmm. And it, here's what here's the housing trust fund to deal with that money that, that we all know and agree that we need. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe that's just a way to make it sort of less daunting because it's like, you know, it's not, it's not a mystery where the funding would be coming from. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Keith, I, I see you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just point of clarification. Uh, I don't know if it matters to you all, but it matters to me. The We're discussing the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund because the state does have their own Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So in all of my documents, I have MAHTF, Municipal Housing oh. Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, but um, the legislation for the real estate transfer fee, it's either goes to CPA or municipal housing trust fund. So, I mean, potentially if the city didn't want to deal with this, then they could just, you know, I don't know, take it off the books and then we'd go to the CPA. So it's not like if that thing passed, you know, we're, we're not gonna not, we want that money. So we're gonna go after it, um, uh, but yeah, so. so okay, it's one of the thanks. Thanks, Keith. Other people had their hands up. Therese? I was just wondering in your thought process, if you know of other municipalities that have um, that are facing similar issues, so who have these municipal trust funds that are um, kind of um, I don't know, losing favor. I don't really know how to describe it, but you know, you might, I'm wondering you might, you might get ideas from other housing mm -hmm. partnerships. Maybe they're facing the same thing. Just a thought. Yeah, we've actually, I think, only researched successful municipal housing. <laughs> That's a very good idea. Thank you. Other thoughts? Um, Edgardo. Uh, yeah, I think that one of the most important things that, um, and by the way, I thought Laura shared a lot of really good, helpful um, information. But one of the one of the ones that I saw was uh, really um, key to our conversation here is is the um, is is the, the the ability to staff uh, such a, a, a committee, and and I feel like I feel like if we we had people who really know, um, uh, have expertise on, on, on these issues of affordable housing. We have people, a nice mix of, of folks who, um, uh, who can bring you know, a lot of good uh, expertise to the table. I really don't see, um, uh, I don't really see a lot of opposition to that. Um, if it came uh, to you know, reforming that trust, um, because I would, I would, I would dare to say that's probably one of the biggest concerns is, um, uh, you know, where are these, you know, where would these folks come from? 
how you know we we barely have enough for the housing uh, partnership at the moment. So that kind of I think I would really love to be part of a subcommittee that kind of figures those logistics out um, so that we could uh, bring you know, a housing trust fund back um, and be able to do a lot more than we're able to do at the moment uh, in terms of advocate and in terms of, uh, you know, uh, looking for resources uh, in order to increase affordable housing in the city. So um, that was really important to me, um, uh, an important point, um, the, the, the staffing piece uh, uh, for, for, that, uh, for that group. Uh, if we can uh, start thinking about those, like I said, I, I'd love to be part of the subcommittee if we want to form one and start really just just doing the work. That sounds like a great idea to me. Gardo, you are offering to be one of those people. Are there other people who might be interested? And then if there are, we could, I don't know if we need a motion, we might need a motion. When? I have a question. So the role of this subcommittee would be to explore further, more in depth, if we could actually get it going. And like Edgardo, I think one of the main things you're saying is that like the city has said to us, you also have thought about who would be, we would need to get people with expertise in these areas on this management board right and how can we explore that and present it in a way that's doable i can work with edgar on that edgar did i paraphrase what you said I yes you did yes you did and i would actually love to add a little bit of uh, more information uh that laura just uh um uh, gave us also because in amherst uh, she believes that in Amherst, the housing sheltering committee was folded into the new municipal housing right. trust. So that would be one of the things that we can explore is right. uh, can we, can we and, and, you know, bring the housing partnership together uh, to create the, uh, the housing trust fund. I, I would even take it even further than that. And this would be some of the work that I would, um, I would volunteer to do on that subcommittee is to reach out to former partnership um, mm -hmm. uh, committee members that, you know, perhaps, um, you know, didn't see a place for them, you know, to be helpful and then decided, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't really need to be part of this anymore, but mm -hmm. who might be enthusiastic about a housing trust fund that would have actually a little bit more, uh, not necessarily just power, but, but access to funds in order to create and to maintain affordable housing in the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd be willing to be on that committee as well. Keith, do we need a motion? Keith isn't here. Keith, do yeah, we need I'm a here. motion? Say it again. Uh, do we need a motion to um, put this into um, action in terms of approving the formation of a housing partnership of a municipal housing trust fund subcommittee to explore that and really push it forward. Yeah, I think I think the I missed a lot of um, what Edgardo said just there, but I think yeah, yeah made a motion just to be clear. I think that's fine. Okay, so Edgardo, would you make the motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion uh, to create a sub. Committee of the Housing Partnership, the Northampton Housing Partnership, uh, right. to explore um, uh, the um, possibilities to bring back the um, um, the housing trust fund in the city. Municipal housing trust fund. Municipal housing trust. Fund. <laughs> okay. Anybody second that? I second that. Okay. Let's go around. So, Hannah. Yes. Ace. Yes. Gwen. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Richard. Yes. Uh, Edgar. Yes. Gordon. Yes. 
and me, yes. Who, who else, so this has been approved. So who else besides Edgar, me and Gwen would like to be to at least be on an initial meeting of this? All right, well, we'll figure it out. Good, we'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so I think Keith, this is your agenda item, uh, item eight, discuss support for upcoming affordable housing projects at the CPA meeting on November 16th. Uh, did you want to discuss the next partnership meeting for December 5th first? Oh, I skipped that. Okay. No. All right. So December 5th, Gordon is not going to be here and I am not going to be here. Um, so we, I put that out to you. Um, we would also need to rearrange January's meeting for the 9th because the 2nd is the federal holiday for New Year's. Um, Keith, when we were talking before about this, we said that if there's enough housing partnership members who want to meet on the, um, in December, we could, um, but I throw that out to you. Um, and we could decide also to not meet in December and go to January. So uh, I think deciding yay or nay on this is, do we have things planned for December that we want to discuss in December? Like, for example, uh, is the subcommittee going to meet in between then and now and we'll come back with, um, you know, points to discuss? Uh, if yes, then I think we definitely should have a December meeting, assuming that we have quorum that can make it. If not, then I think we should skip it. That is such a common sense approach. It's just like, wow. I, I personally think that the subcommittee is going to need more time than between now and December because we have holidays, et cetera, and I'm going to be gone for several weeks. So I think I think it would be fine to put it up till January 9th. I don't think a huge amount will be accomplished in December. All right, so. Hannah had her hand up. Hannah. Something that I just wanted to ask about um, the implications of skipping a December meeting, and this would also fall under business not anticipated, is that I saw the email from um, Alex Jarrett that there's been like sort of the first official pushback to the broker fee yes. home rule petition. So I, I did just want to ask if, you know, skipping a December meeting, like if there's going to be any sort of action items that we have to do or, or like any actions that we have to take between now and January. Um, that's a question, just a question. Yeah. Ace, did you have your hand up? Uh, responding to that specifically, to my understanding, um, no, based on when the hearing for that was, it sounded like they had wanted feedback from any member of the partnership that could write it quickly. Um, and given the stop start nature of all this, and also the very last minute notification we've had for it uh, every single time, like it's entirely possible that something would come in in a timely manner such that it would be good to discuss in December. And it's entirely possible that we won't hear from them again until March. Um, so at least in my opinion, for that specific matter, I don't think it's a, a good enough reason to meet in December. I think aside from providing feedback immediately to the um, people on the email that there's nothing much more we can do right now. Yeah. Okay, so- uh, Gwen's hand. Gwen? I have a question. So is it, um, and it wasn't on the agenda for tonight, but, and thank you, Hannah, for reminding me of that. I just wonder if um, in January, we could maybe have a discussion on the January agenda 
um, to write a letter to the Gazette maybe, or just, you know. Sure, we could. And I was interested, I was interested in Laura Baker's comment around keep the op-eds going, but also keep letters to the editor going. And even though we are all in this housing partnership, it does not, that doesn't prevent any of us from writing a letter to the editor with our opinion about a housing issue that's coming up. So, okay. all right, so we're good. We're not gonna meet in December, right? And um, Edgardo, Gwen and I are gonna figure out a time to meet around the subcommittee and start that and really push ahead. Okay, um, so do, shall we move on to item eight then? Keith, I uh, think that is yours. Uh, uh, Carmen, just, uh, and do we decide on January 2nd or January 9th as opposed to January 2nd? I think we have to go with January 9th because January 2nd is the federal holiday. And I just feel like that's asking for a lot. So okay. January 9th is fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you want me to go? Yes, please. Yeah, so I had uh, forged you all um, uh, a document. I was linked to the, I don't think the link worked on the actual um, agenda, but I did send the PDF and this is what's going to be um, at um, the CPA or CPC meeting on the 16th. Um, so really there's three big projects. So one is kind of the pre-development affordable housing fund. Uh, so fifty thousand dollars. So that's things like site design, um, uh, surveys, ESAs, things like that. Um, and that's really just so we can have a pipeline of different parcels available um, for Valley and Laurel uh, or Valley. Yeah, for Piner Valley um, habitat and um, uh, Valley community development. Um, they're no longer all Valley for me. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this really kind of frees up their, the, them to do what they do is developing. And, you know, uh, some of these things are, you know, it's just, it takes a little time. And, um, you know, the, um, the next project on that was the we're calling downtown housing. So it's off of Crafts Avenue. That's for $60,000. So that is those scary looking stairs, stairs behind City Hall. Uh, the proposal is to, um, and the crumbling, to get rid of that um, and put in uh, like 20 units or something like that. Um, so this is, there. it's a very complicated site because it's on a hill right. and there's some water. Um, but um, this, and we have part of the, funding for this is the Mass Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant, which we did receive, I believe. Um, so that's exciting. Um, you know, we get some affordable housing close to all sorts of services and things like that. Um, and uh, Leeds Housing, uh, this should, would be probably just a one unit, uh, something like a first time home buyer or something. Um, there's some complications on the site. It previously had some pipes on it. Um, so these are just um, just a quick overview, but this is where there might be some, you know, conflict with the other things that are happening in the CPC meeting. Uh, so if people want to go to the meeting to voice your support uh, for these different projects. Um, and, you know, we're not at the point where I don't think there'll be a huge lot of public um, people there, uh, but still we'll be talking to the CPC and if we can get the full request. Uh, for these, that would be really nice. Um, so, whenever I uh, whenever I get a um, CPC agenda or a planning board or anything like that that has a um, you know housing on it, I'm going to forward it to you all. Um, and whether that's in between a meeting that we have here, um, or um, you just want to go as a as a concerned member of the public, um, but. Uh, I thought it was important to uh, let you guys know about these projects coming forward. So, and this is when uh, is that? Uh, well, November sixteenth. Uh, it's on the email. Uh, yeah. So. But if you have the questions, I'm here to. Um, I'm here. So. Okay. 
November 16th. That's next week, Thursday. Anybody have a question or comment before we wrap the meeting up? I guess I, I always just get a little worried as being representative of the housing partnership that, you know, do we have to have a vote that it's okay to, you know, I mean, I'm happy to go just as myself, as a member of, a concerned member of the community, but I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts on that. I think you can say you're a member of the housing partnership and uh, these are, this is a concern of ours and, you know, this is, this is my thoughts. Uh, we, we can't, we cannot vote on what you're going to say in the future. Um, so uh, I think it's perfectly okay just to say a member of the housing partnership. Okay. Good. All right. Any other comments? It's 6.57. Edgar, are you still there? I'm still here. Would you would you send Gwen and myself an email so we can start coordinating when we're going to meet and how we're going to do that? Sure thing. Great. Can you add me to that email too? I'm, I'm willing to be part of that subcommittee. Nice. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> All right. I'll entertain a motion to... Oh, Richard, go ahead. Uh, I think that Keith may want to correct the time that he just sent out on the notice of our next meeting, unless we're going to meet for two and a half hours. I think Keith always puts from 5.30 to 8, just in case we go over a few minutes. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, because I mentioned this to you before you clarified. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Right. So um, who would like to, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Move to adjourn. Second. Gordon seconds. Listen, everybody who I won't see, have good holidays. Yeah. Everybody. See you on January 9th. See a couple of you before that, or maybe three of you. And um, be well.